All right, two problems we're going to talk about today. The seam carving video that I showed last week and gerrymandering, another dynamic programming problem that has relevance to the way districts, political districts, are, are, uh, are created. So you remember the problem, the seam carving problem that we started discussing, you have a very, you have an image of a certain dimension and you'd like to reduce the dimension in either X or Y. And you have a few options. You can scale the image. You can just delete entire columns from this image. Or you can do what seam carving suggests, which is to delete the least, the lowest energy seam. And here is an implementation of this algorithm. So what we can do is say, try to figure out Let's delete a few seams here. Let me first center this. So if we want to delete several seams, you can see in red, the algorithm is trying to find the lowest energy seams and iteratively removing them. Now some of those seams are basically removing parts of the face which make the face look very funny. So what we can do as an interface which was shown in that movie, you can select certain parts of the image that you're going to add a lot of energy to. So if I add energy to this part, no, no low energy seam will actually ever touch it. So now it's going to rerun those algorithms and notice that none of the facial features are ever subtracted. Everybody see the red line there? Okay, and we can, of course, do this in the other dimension as well. And now seems that m basically the wallpaper is being removed. Okay, and now once we've pre-computed that data set, we can actually expand the image by looking at where a seam was and duplicating it or contract it interactively. So once that pre-processing is done, and now you can imagine a website that has, that needs to display an image on a phone. Instead of doing what it does currently, it can use this type of interface right here. Like once that pre-computation is done, the image can be scaled as such to fit the widest screen monitor, etc. Everybody get a sense of the power of the algorithm and what it would be used for? Unfortunately, Chrome hasn't implemented this yet, and I guess it requires some annotation of pictures with faces and so forth. The people who make websites would have to annotate those images properly, and I guess people don't do that. But in theory, at least the computer science is there to, to implement this type of content-aware resizing. Okay, so let's try to understand how that algorithm works. What I really like about this problem it was published in SIGGRAPH 2007, which is the top tier conference for graphics research. And the algorithm is something that we can teach in a first year algorithms course. So the insight was really asking the right question. That understanding that on websites, images have to be resized, how can you do that? And having taken undergraduate algorithms course, you'd have all the tools that you needed in order to answer a question like that. That's what I think is really great about this problem. <coughs> Okay, so here's the goal. Input image, output image is, let's say in this case, we're only going to shrink in the horizontal. Uh, we're going to remove columns. So the fundamental problem, if we want to make this image one pixel less wide, we have to remove essentially one pixel from each row. Now, the default way to do it is to remove those pixels, pick some column. That's like cropping the image. Pick some column and remove each of those pixels. But why, why should we constrain ourselves to remove, wh why should the pixels be aligned in a column? Well, the point is we want some continuity. We don't want to remove pixels from here and then remove an other pixels from here. That would make the image sort of shift. But it turns out that if, if you remove pixels along some path, then the visual impact of making that image slightly, slightly less wide is not as severe. 
And so the first observation is instead of removing a, a column or cropping the image just by, in fact, cropping is essentially removing columns from the left or the right. Instead of doing that, we're going to remove a path. This digitizer is a little bit off, so where I put my pen and where the cursor appears is now a random variable, so bear with me as I try to write with this. So in particular, we're going to call that path a seam. So a seam is going to be a path from the bottom row to the top row of this image in which each pixel in this path it is connected to it's going to be connected to either it's the pixel immediately above it the pixel immediately to the above and left or the pixel immediately to the above and right so it's a connected path between the top and bottom where connectivity is by essentially the upper diagonal so upper left diagonal upper straight or upper right diagonal So first observation, in order to make this image one pixel less wide, we need to remove a path. The path is connected in this particular way. If we do it this way, the visual impact of the, of the operation is minimized. Next question, which path should we remove? And the insight from the SIGGRAPH paper was that we should remove the path that has the least energy to it. And they had one no notion of energy, they investigated three others. This is the one that they recommend. It's essentially the gradient. So if you take Jason Lawrence, another professor here, was kind enough to give me a very simple program that computes the gradient of an image. And if you want to see a before image and the gradient image. The gradient was defined by this equation. You're basically taking the x and y the difference as a, at a particular pixel, how much is changing if I change in the x dimension and how much is changing in the y dimension. You can do that with some sort of differencing operation. So it's rather efficient to turn an image into its gradient image. So that'll be the second operation. Take the image and turn and compute its gradient at every pixel. And now, the part that we care about is find the seam which has the lowest energy, meaning the energy at each of the pixels along this seam, the sum of the energy along each of the pixels of this seam is lowest with respect to any other seam in the image. It's the seam that's least likely to be perceptible by your eye. If we think that your eye is percept, you know, perceives uh, edges or gradients where there's a distinction between uh, two neighboring objects in an image, the lowest energy seam is going to be the least perceptible seam in the image. So that is the problem with seam carving. Identify the lowest energy seam. And with that, we're going to approach the problem with dynamic programming. So we're going to first define a variable, sij. And this is going to be the, the total energy. So it, is, it represents energy. sij is going to be an energy. And it's going to be the particular energy of the path that ends at ij that is the smallest among all paths that end at ij. So for example, so let's say n is the, n is the height of the image, then snj would be, okay, so if this right here was j, then snj would be the path that ends right there that has the lowest energy. So of course, there's going to be some path that ends right there, some seam, and we want the energy of the lowest energy seam. Why would we want this value? 
Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Because if we had SN1, SN2, SN all the way up to M, where let's say M right here is the width of the image, if we had all of these values right here, once we had them computed, we could just do a scan and find them in on this. And then we would know that the best path to remove has to end right at that pixel. And just like the other dynamic programming problems, if we add one more variable to this that keeps our backtracking, i.e. the choice that we made at each of these pixels, then we could follow that choice all the way back and figure out exactly what that path is. So the real crux of the problem is going to be how to compute SNJ. Everybody get a sense of what SNJ is now? Questions? Yes. Well, so once, we, remember that the image, let's say the image is of height n. So after we've computed SN1, SN2, all the way up to SNM, all we have to do is make a comparison among all of these, find the minimum, which we can just do by linearly looking at each one and keeping track of the minimum so far. And then once we have that minimum, then we, we can backtrack and figure out the path. More questions? <coughs> so then the question is, how do we find, there are exponentially many, there, there are way too many paths that end, that start at the bottom and end at SNJ, right? You can, in fact, this is a problem that you've already solved, right? This was the Manhattan routing problem. It's actually worse than Manhattan, because in Manhattan all you can do is goes up and to the left. Here you can also go diagonal. And so, certainly it's going to be more than Fibonacci. Uh, I mean, the recurrence that we had for Manhattan was more than Fibonacci. The recurrence here would be more than Manhattan. And so there are going to be exponentially pa many paths that begin in this bath, bottom row and end at that top row, using only those up and left and diagonal mo motions that were allowed. So we can't just do the simple thing of looking at every path. We're going to have to use a more clever approach, which of course in this case is a dynamic programming approach. So, <coughs> given that we want to compute SNJ, what values do you think are going to help us compute SNJ? Well, perhaps if you'd already solved the problem for the first n minus 1 rows, you might be able to extend your solution to that nth row. And let's take a look at how that would work. Okay, so suppose... So you have Sn minus 1 of 1 all the way up to M. And now you would like to compute this one right here. Let's say S of N of 1. Well, notice that the only paths that you can get to get to 1 involve these two values right here. Right? So what this suggests is that Sn, it's going to be the min of plus the energy at n comma 1. Right? Each of these pixels has a particular energy value that's, that, it's, that is its gradient. The energy of a seam is the energy at each of the pixels in that seam. So this value is just going to be the minimum of these two plus the energy right there. So if you followed, you should be able to now give me an equation for, this was a special case right here in the middle. Okay, this was the special case right here. What about the generic case? Spend a minute with your neighbor and explain what that generic case is going to be. All right. So if you understood the problem, you understood that the, the seam that ends at this pixel, the very last thing it could have done was either swerve, shimmy, or shake. Could have gone from the left or the middle or the right. 
That's how it got there. The seam had to do one of these three operations. That's a something, that's a familiar theme. We've seen that with the staircase thing. We've seen that with log cutter. We've seen that with the matrix. We've seen that with the quick fire Manhattan routing problem. We see that here too. That this path has a limited number of options. And all we got to do is consider the best solution at this spot and augment it with the energy of the current pixel. And so that's going to be something like the energy of the current pixel plus the min of either the shake, shimmy, or swerve with a few special cases to handle the extreme left here and the extreme right. Question? Infinities, yes, because we want to take a min. So this is like saying, if you're all the way at the left, where if j is equal to 1, so you're all the way at the left, well, j minus 1 is not going to be defined. So, what? Everybody get this equation? Good. Because then the way to solve this problem, right, the way to solve it, is we're going to start all the way at the bottom. And we're going to initialize each of these pixels. We're going to initialize s of 1, comma i, with just the energy of that pixel. <coughs> just like that. And then the next step, so once we've solved, once we've solved the row, we'll make it orange. The next step is just to, for i is from 2 to n, just use the formula that we just typed in, or we just wrote, in order to compute the energy of each of these pixels. Question. This right. This algorithm is going to identify the least energy seam. And then that's the seam that we want to remove in step one. And then we're going to have to run this algorithm again for step two. And in, perhaps we can be clever by reusing some of these things. But if you think about it, there's a little bit of subtlety. Like, it's not exactly clear how to reuse the computation from one step to do the next step. But just imagine that this is a computation that allows us to reduce the image by one pixel. And that we can keep on using that in order to reduce as many pixels as we want. <coughs> okay? And then, of course, the final step, after we've computed all the way up to n, is to identify, identify the min in this row. It's going to be some pixel. And then we can use backtracking in order to figure out exactly what that path was. Question. What does what dot mean? Right here? Uh, this, is the, this notation just means um, an anonymous argument. So what I'm saying is S1 is just a, it's a function that takes one index. If I had two dots, it would be a function that takes two indices. I did want to specify exactly what that was. So what is the running time? <coughs> what is the running time of the algorithm? Where is most of the work going to be done? This loop right here, right? That loop is going to run n times, and it's going to compute the pixels right here for the entire width. So this part of the computation is going to take order what? Exactly. And this part of the computation is going to take order n. And so the total running time is, it's linear in the size of the image. Which is why I used that one very small picture instead of, I took a picture of this class, but it was uh, a panorama and it was uh, 8 million pixels and so it didn't run in that browser. Question. That is right. First observation, this is a pretty simple algorithm, right? Each of you can code this. Each of you can actually construct it and code it. And so the real insight there was the ask the right question and have the right tool set, right? Know the right tools, one of them being dynamic programming. So when you go off to work at Twitter or the next Facebook <clears throat> and you're encountered with some interesting problem, you'll have the right tool set to come up with interesting solutions like this. Or, as our next example shows, 
if you go become a political operative in Washington, D.C., you'll also have the tools to manipulate this country. <clears throat> okay, so the next problem is going to be, just in my style, this is a simplification of a process that occurs in real life. We're going to try to extract many of the details, but you can imagine how you can put those details back into this problem. Here is the situation. You know that we live in a democracy, but our democracy is, <clears throat> is broken, it, it's fragmented. So each state is, decide, is divided into congressional districts. We, for example, are currently in the fifth district of Virginia. And notice how that's shaped. It, it has a little Charlottesville and a lot of something else over here. Um, each district is further broken down into precincts. <coughs> so in Charlottesville, we have these particular precincts. And now the question is, how are these districts and precincts defined and how are they combined? And do you know who makes those decisions? Me and... Civics, come on, who, makes, who decides what congressional district boundaries are? State legislature, yes. <clears throat> so, here is the problem. Suppose you have many precincts. Precincts are perhaps defined in some more natural way. The question is, how do you collect precincts into districts? So, <coughs> let's make a few simplifications. So, our precincts are like this. <coughs> Each precinct has the same number of people, let's say. Let's say it has M people in it. Okay? And now the question is, you have to collect precincts, and perhaps these precincts are one district, and perhaps these precincts are a second district. So, what state legislatures try to figure out is how do we take these precincts and make them into the number of congressional districts that we need to make. In our case, let's only consider, let's consider a small state. Now this problem can be generalized to do many districts. <clears throat> well, let's only, let's pretend like we're in New Hampshire. We only have two districts, or Rhode Island. Okay. Now, each precinct, it's going to be, there's going to be some fraction of precinct four that votes for party A. Okay? Okay, so let's call that A of four. That's the fraction that votes. Okay? And of course, party B, in fact, let's not make it the fraction, let's make the number of votes. Let's make this the... So each precinct has, each precinct I has AI and BI. AI is the number of people that are going to vote for party A, and BI is the number of people that are going to vote for party B. And of course, by our definition, BI is just the number of people in that district minus the number of people who are going to vote for A. So another simplification is we're going to be a two-party system. We might even consider the one-party system, but then the problem wouldn't be so interesting. All right, so that's our, that's our picture of the world right here. And so this is, when, this is how we come to the gerrymandering problem. Okay, the problem is we're going to be given M and A1, A2, all the way up to, let's say that they're N districts. <coughs> and what we want to output, sorry, they're, that they're N precincts, what we want to output are two sets, D1 and D2, two districts. Okay, and here are the situation, here's what we want. The size of D1 is equal to the size of D2, i.e., same number 
of fair is fair. We have to appear like we're doing this in a fair way. So each dis district has to be the same size. But here's what we want. We want the number of people that are going to vote for party A in district 1 to be greater than and we want the number of people that are going to vote for party A. The other thing we can assume to make this problem simpler is that N is even. Right, so that this property can be held. So that's what we want. We want to district our precincts. But we want to do it in a way that seems fair, but isn't fair. Okay? All right, so let me give you an example. Here is an example. Let's make it into... Oh, this is going to be too big. Okay. Here we go. Let's call this A1, A2, A3, and A4. And now let me come up with some numbers here. Um, Okay. <coughs> so notice, if we make our districts like this, let's say we take our districts like, uh, sorry. Let's say we make our districts like this. So in this case, A1 and A3, they have 119 votes, and so that's going to be a majority. Okay, but in A2 and A4, we're going to have 92 votes, and so it's a minority. <clears throat> Who says we have to do it that way? How about we consider those two? And so now, A1, A4 is going to have 109 and A2, A3 is going to have 101. And, of course, both of these districts are continuous, right? Because here there's one intersection, let's call it Main Street, it's a four-way intersection, and the district goes right through that Main Street this way. How do we know what M is? M is given as input. In this situation, I'm going to make M equal 100. Question? Yes. So like I said when we started, we're going to make this problem really simple so we can get to the heart of the dynamic programming problem. Then, of course, we're going to add a bunch of complicated... Then one can add the constraints of reality. Uh, the fact that each precinct has slightly different number of people, the fact that in real life these precincts actually have to be continuous, they can't just be a random smattering of precincts across the state, at least after the, you know, there was a Supreme Court case about it, that that's why we call it a gerrymander. Um, <clears throat> one of the justices said it looked, one of the districts looked like a, like a fish. A salmon, uh, uh, Salamander, yeah. And then there was a governor, something Jerry, that. Uh, what? Uh, are you? Did you know that, or did you Google it? Oh. Uh. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a question. Ah. Well, <clears throat> each district is going to have n over two people in it, right? And each to have a majority, you have to have uh, roughly. So each district is going to have m n over two people in it, right? Because each district has sorry, each district is going to have n over two precincts, and there are m people in each precinct. So the number of people in each district is going to be m n over two, and so this is going to be majority. Did everybody follow that? Why m n over four is a majority? So in this situation, we had m is a hundred, n is four. So each district has 200 people in it, and we need 
m times n, which is 100 times 4 over 4, which is we need more than 100 people to have a majority. Follow? Okay. So how are we going to do this? As I mentioned two lectures ago, we are slowly building up our skills in dynamic programming, starting with a very simple staircase and log cutter. This is an advanced technique. <clears throat> and uh, it's going to be, so log cutter was one dimensional, right? Matrix chain was two dimensional. These other problems involve, uh, seam carving was two dimensional. This is going to be a, whoa, four dimensional dynamic programming problem. And it's going to involve a little twist. Okay? So how do we do this? How do we start any dynamic programming problem? Imagine the very last precinct. So what is the state of the world? Before we assign that very last precinct, we're going to have two districts so far. District 1 is going to have k precincts in it so far. And it's going to have, let's say, x voters. District 2 is going to have n minus 1 minus k precincts in it. And it's going to have y voters. Now, fundamentally, that's the state, and now we have to decide. Here's precinct n. Okay? We have to decide. Do we make it part of District 1? Or do we make it part of District 2? What happens if we assign it to District... Let's decide what happens when we put precinct n in District 1. Well, then District 1 is going to have k plus... District 1 will have k plus 1 precincts in it, and it'll have x plus a n votes. And District 2, it's not going to change, right? And it's going to have y. So in particular, I think we can summarize this by saying that the state of the world is going to be k comma x and n minus k minus 1 comma y. And now here, if we do the other thing, state, we're going to have k and x, and this will be n minus k y plus a n. <coughs> Question? Just with two districts is four dimensional. You can, you can use other techniques to handle more districts, but if you just do this right here, then yeah, as you, as you add districts, it'll increase in dimensionality. But you could still solve it with dynamic programming. Question? Good observation. Good observation. Um, <clears throat> So, <clears throat> what you're saying is that once we come to this state, the very last thing we're kind of forced to put the district in one spot or another spot. Uh, that is in fact true, and that's slightly different than our other uh, problems. But uh, we're kind of we're going to be working in a different order. So, just hold that thought for a second. In other words, for log cutter, you can put the same sort of constraint on. That very last cut, uh, you know, if I've already... I'm not going to go that, down that way, but just bear with me for a second. As you attack a problem like this, the reason I'm taking a snapshot of this screen right here is that when you see similar problems, think about how the decision, that very last decision, is going to change the state of the world. And from this, this will help you, ins inspire you to come up with the recursive structure that we're looking for. So this is the twist I'm talking about. In all previous cases, our dynamic programming variable was a number. 
In this case, we're going to actually make it a Boolean value, true or false. Okay? It's going to be true or false, and it's going to be true if there exists, this funny E means there exists, an assignment of J our dynamic programming variable is going to be a true or false value S of J K X Y these are the four dimensions and it's going to be true if there exists an assignment of the first J precincts we have only looking at the first J such that K of those precincts belong to district 1 and there are X votes for District 1 and Y votes for District 2. And now two things remain for me. First, I need to show you how to compute this value. And second, I need to show why this value matters. Let's do these in reverse order. Why does this value matter? So you remember with scene carving, we were actually computing many values. We were computing SI1, uh, sorry, S1 of n, Sn of 1, Sn of 2, Sn of 3, and we knew that our solution was going to be among that top row. We just had to find the minimum where that was true. All right, so we were computing more variables than we actually needed. It was slight departure from our previous solutions where we always knew that best n was the thing we're after and best n was defined in this particular way. With seam carving, we didn't know which seam we actually wanted, but we could compute all the top-level values and then pick the one that was the best. Here, we're going to compute many of these particular values. What do you think... What if S of N, comma, N over 2, comma... If this value is true, what does that mean? Based on the way I defined S, if that value is true, what does it mean? In the back. Yes, we have assigned N precincts. It's true if there is an assignment of the first N precincts, such that District 1 has N over 2 of them. And the number of people voting for A in District 1 is greater than majority. It is MN plus 1 over 4. And the number of people voting for candidate uh, for A in District 2 is MN plus 1. Oh, I think you already got one, right? So in this case, question? Well, this is a specific value that says there's a way to get it exactly so that both, one, both, both A and both uh, District 1 and District 2 have MN plus 1 over 4 votes. But for example, in, our, in the example that I drew, right, it would have been S of 4 comma 2, comma 101, comma 112. So, in other words, what we actually need to figure out, our actual solution is going to be, so the way we're going to approach this problem is that we're going to compute a lot of these recursive values, of these S values. We're going to create, I can't draw it because it's four-dimensional, but we're going to create a lot of them. If I project, if I project, uh, in fact, n and n over 2, if I fix those, what I'm going to be looking for, see, I put those two dots to mean those dots are going to be the x and the y axis. What we're going to look for is a variable that, in which y or x is in any of these configurations such that S of n comma n over 2 x, y is true. Because one of those variables means there was a way to assign n precincts such that the first one had n over 2 and a majority voted for A in the first district and a majority voted for A in the second district. Does that make sense? Well, if S n comma n over 2 comma 101 comma 111, if that's true, that means that we found a way to gerrymander such that this one had 101 and this one had 111. And in fact, any time that you get over majority here and any time that you get over majority there is going to be a good gerrymander. There might not be a way, for example, in this case, 
There isn't a way to gerrymander for 112 comma 103. Or there isn't, in fact, there isn't a way to gerrymander for 101 comma 108. Right? There's not a way. So, S of 4 comma 2 comma 101 comma 108 is false, but S of 4 comma 2 comma 101 comma 109 is true. And so, because this is true, there's a good gerrymander. So, have I resolved why it's important to compute this variable? Does that make sense? Because once we have this variable for all of the values that we care about, then it's a matter of just scanning the ones in the range that we care about right here for any value that's true. Once we found any value that's true, we know a gerrymander is possible. And our political ambitions can be realized. So the first point, if this is the definition, how can I compute S of J comma K comma X comma Y in terms of smaller values of that? In particular, how can I compute it in terms of J minus 1? I have six minutes left and I want you to think about this with the, I'm going to spend my last six minutes giving three of them to you. Think about how you can compute this, this is the heart of dynamic programming. This is the heart of it. So spend three minutes intensely trying to come up with this formula. Yeah. K in this is going to be the size of the number of, it's the size of District 1. The number of precincts that you've assigned to, to District 1. Yeah. And in fact, this image right here, the solution is going to be combining this image with that image. This idea right here with that idea right there, it'll give you the answer. This is what happens when you assign a district. Uh, so when you assign a precinct to a district, one of two things can happen. So now figure out how to combine that with this equation. What happens when you assign that j precinct to a district? So now you'll see how we don't really, that constraint of where we're going to put the last district, it doesn't matter because we're just going to compute that big box and then we're only going to look at this particular spots at S of N comma N over 2. In this case, we only want to, we want to take our precincts and put them into two districts. Of course, in any large state like California, you have to split your precincts into 54 districts or in Virginia, 13, so forth. Uh, but we're just doing two for the simple case here. This particular algorithm, the technique would though, you just have to change this variable to be slightly more complicated. I mean, in real life, you also have these constraints that precincts need to be adjacent. And here, this problem doesn't. All we need to do is make sure they're equal size, right? But I mean, let's not get caught up in those details. You can add those constraints later. Let's figure out how to do the simplest case. The fight's out. <clears throat> So, I got one minute to, to answer this question. The only way that you can split the first J precincts such that D1 has size K, there are only two ways to do it. Either you took that J, you, you took that J precinct and you assigned it to District 1, and District 1 had X minus AN votes, and District 2 had Y votes, or you assign that district to district 2, you assign the jth precinct to district 2, and that in the state was you had j minus 1 precincts, k of them were in district 1, you already had x people voting for a in district 1, and you had y minus a n people voting in that other district. Think about this, we'll go over it again on Tuesday a little bit, but this equation and that previous slide about you're just going to compute this equation in four dimensions and then you're going to look for a particular truth value in that particular range. That's true, you have it. 